In February, two white supremacists shot and killed 25-year-old Ahmaud Arbery while he was jogging near his home in Georgia. There have been zero consequences for the brutal attack until a video surfaced. And finally, last week, the uh, perpetrators were arrested and charged with murder and aggravated assault. Our next guest, Natasha Leonard, writes, there can be little doubt that without the viral spread of a video capturing Arbery's harrowing final moments, no such charges will be brought. Her recent piece the perversity of needing to see Ahmaud Arbery die on video to recognize that his Black live, Lives Mattered is up now. Natasha Leonard, columnist for The Intercept and author of the book, Being Numerous, Essays on Non-Fascist Life. Natasha, thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hi. So uh, as I said, Ahmaud Arbery was shot in February. The charges are only occurring now. Can you talk about the role of the video that surfaced? Um, yes. So, I mean, just as a kind of empirical point, when you look at the timing, um, these charges were only brought within 48 hours um, of this video surfacing and then spreading and uh, garnering a huge amount of public outrage and anger from prolific celebrities and just millions of views uh, through shares on Twitter um, and uh, YouTube. So, uh, you know, one, there, there's almost just no denying um, that without this sort of content spreading, this, this really um, brutal and intolerable content spreading, that there would have been no significant action, or it seems at least there would have been no significant action um, certainly not from the local district uh, attorney's office in Georgia. It took uh, the Ge Georgia Bureau of Investigations to actually start pursuing any sort of institutional justice. And um, I don't think it's an accident that um, one of the, the, the men who have now finally been charged with this murder for this execution, um, was also a former investigator for the local district attorney's office. Wow. Um, so, you know, I, <laughs> uh, I think one can't uh, discount the, the sheer relevance of this video. And that to me is, is just so tragic and appalling. And I also think it's, it's difficult obviously with headlines in stories. Um, and in, in the Intercept headline, it says, why do we, we need to see this, this perverse um, spectacle of a black man being executed. And, you know, we should also raise, who is this we? I mean, none of Arbery's community, his family, um, so few people who knew this young man um, and a kind of broader black community at large and any sort of justice advocate didn't need to see this video to recognize a lynching to know that this had been a murderous execution and a racist one. The we is formal establishments of justice and that is a white establishment. And so I think it's always worth clarifying like who is that we that needs, appears to need to see this. Your piece revealed uh, that the same video evidence, was, the video was already known months ago. It had been seen by that other we, the we of the formal justice system. I, I find that really um, disturbing on a number of levels, although I already know how things work. <laughs> um, you know, and what else is disturbing about that video is that, you know, the social media sharing of it and the pointing out of, of how disgraceful and intolerable it is, um, is one thing. The actual capturing of the video, which uh, isn't, you know, wasn't made necessarily clear when clips were shared and pointed to, um, the video was actually taken by a neighbor of the executioners. And he believed that it actually exonerated them or would exonerate them. Because um, so I think that <laughs> detail. <laughs> what, how? How did he well, think that? I mean, if we think of the long and unbroken history of- Perhaps they forgot um, that you're not allowed to just shoot black people. <laughs> right, exactly. They thought, so, oh, so well. To presume that this, I mean, unquestionable evidence, this unquestionable incidence of a lynching would just in and of itself um, 
bring about a reckoning and a justice would be to ignore the long and unbroken history in which there is, you know, evidence and, you know, an unquestionable showing of murderous and brutal violence. And the logic of so much of American law is, well, actually that was fine. And so that is also as striking that you, you can see this and still, you know, the justice system can agree with claims of this is self-defense. And what does that say about the way black individuals, black skin is just criminalized and can even be seen that way in the case of an on video murder? Um, here are some questions coming in from our chat. From Political Puppy, a question for your guest. How big is Ahmad Arbery on mainstream uh, or right-wing media? Could it be beyond justice for Ahmad and become a larger lasting push for change? Um, I, don't, I, you know, I don't know how, how big it is on, on right-wing media. Um, and I don't know, you know, I haven't scanned um, the Daily Caller, or certainly not anything as um, terrible as Nazi sites like the Daily Stormer. I don't presume that those Nazi sites calling... like like Fox News. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't presume Nazi like that are calling for justice. Um, you know, the story was certainly picked up and written about by the New York Times and the establishment media once it had become a major. Um, kind of point of public care and outrage. Um, questions of turning points. I mean, that's so often, that's so often something one with an eye towards horror and something that seems so clearly intolerable. When these sort of things come become public, there is, there is a, a great desire that, that some sort of reckoning would come um, but I, I sadly say that we've seen this too many times. You know, we watched um, through other viral content, Eric Garner take his last breath mm -hmm. while choked by NYPD officers. Um, and yet we still had to go through years of proving that the NYPD officers, you know, had some sort of, uh, you know, they were... They I mean, and in, and in all of these cases, there were no convictions. Daniel Pantaleo was not convicted of killing, mm -hmm. um, of murdering um, Eric Garner. So what are we talking well, about? Well, these two other guys were not on the police force, right? That would have been a whole different... But nor was Trayvon point. Martin's killer, George Zimmerman, you know? And he was obviously... And so that was, I mean, the, pu the, the publicity that Trayvon Martin's case garnered and the the huge outcry and public rage and then activism and action and direct action in the streets and the kind of advocacy from um, black communities and um, allies and justice, social justice advocates was obviously massive and could be spoken about a turning point. Was it a turning point towards a true achievement of justice or recognition? No. Or this I, think, I mean, what I see as a hopeful issue here is that once these videos do get out in the community, the, com the community has an uproar. It's unfortunate that justice doesn't just get served because it's just, but it is heartening to see that there are advocates all over who just really think this is unjust and needs and people need to be brought to justice. I wonder if, uh, you know, I, I just wonder when we're going to see the effect of that on our justice system. Any thoughts about that? I mean, one can't speak of timing because it's <laughs> it's so far off. Um, we haven't even begun to see a gesture towards that. Um, proof of proof being these videos still exist. Mm -hmm. um, and my column was was um, in part highlighting to to kind of point out the kind of sheer background state of, of violence that that evidence is, that when there is a brutal murder um, of a white person, in order for the wheels of formal justice to start moving, there doesn't need to be some visible spectacle shown to justice establishments and shown to investigators. Um, and indeed, uh, it's been a very long time 
since we've seen white corpses and white murders need to be shared at this level to demand justice. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we often see the families of um, white murdered victims um, demand that that kind of content be removed from public view because it's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is that awful, the double standard points to a state of racism mm -hmm. and an unbroken state of racism. And that's what um, I think is also worth considering. That is not to say this content shouldn't be shared or doesn't need sharing. And that's not mine to say. I just think to notice that double standard is to reckon with how differently lives are treated. You also, in your piece, write about the different ways black and white families react to public videos of their loved ones dying. Can you talk about those differences? Um, um, and yeah, and I mean, I can't obviously um, speak to their kind of subjective experience. Um, and I can, um, you know, uh, can't generalize across like all black families and all white families. Um, but we have just seen again and again in cases where there have been very brutal murders or executions of white people caught on camera. Um, it has been considered dehumanizing to share that content. So a journalist named Alison Parker in 2015 was shot by an angered ex-colleague while she was on camera filming a, a news segment. And um, the tabloids and news institutions that published still frames even of the moment before her death as the bullet was kind of coming towards her, it was considered very kind of bad taste, ill taste. Um, consider the execution, the beheading of James Foley. Um, tabloids that showed even the moments before his execution were decried for, for dehumanizing this person by showing him at his, his most ab abject and broken and terrifying moment, the end of his life. Um, I, I, you know, we must just recognize that there is a double standard here. What might that double standard speak to? And I think it is the sad case that if black life was already humanized by the white establishment and already considered a registered loss in its taking, then, you know, would there be such a necessity for justice departments and investigatory bodies to actually have this evidence put in front of their face and shared by the public crying out for some sort of justice. Um, I mean, Occam's razor down, perhaps not. Mm -hmm. um, what were the white supremacists who hunted down and killed Ahmaud Arbery charged with? And do you think it's accurate? Um, Right now, they've been charged with murder and aggravated assault. So, do you um, think it should be considered a domestic terror incident? Um, well, I think, yeah, and there are, there are considerations of whether there will be hate crime charges um, added. I think it undoubtedly um, appears appears and is a hate crime. Mm -hmm. um, domestic terror is you know it's not really technically a charge; it's a categorization for a type of investigation. So um, there's no such thing really in the, the justice codes in the US of charged with domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of an investigatory category, mm -hmm. but there are of course hate crime statutes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's correct that these are being considered as worth applying in this case. Um, whatever happens in <laughs> the judicial procedures now, I think it's worth reckoning that there can be no justice. Even if, if these men spend the rest of their lives in jail, mm -hmm. there's still a 25 year old young man who went out for a jog and was executed. Um, and a mother and father left behind. Left behind um, and speaking so so mournfully and gratefully of this young man's life. And um, you know, there, there can be no justice in a circumstance like this. Um, and I don't really feel like there's much justice um, Likely, we've seen so many cases, even, even the most um, extreme and correct meeting out of judicial or carceral justice, which is only its own kind of justice, um, yeah. that doesn't stop that it was considered uh, an appropriate or, 
or reasonable or even possible thing to do to watch a young black man jogging and these two white men go and grab their guns and chase him with a truck. Um, Unbelievable. You know, there, where's the, there can never be justice in this instant when a world like this exists. We're, we're speaking with Natasha Leonard, contributing writer for The Intercept, author and educator. Natasha, question coming in from our chat from Lauren. Uh, is there any information of an investigation or charges brought against the attempted cover-up by the two recused district attorneys and anyone else involved? I actually, I don't, I don't know that. Um, I would be, I, I'm not aware of that, but I also don't know, so I couldn't, couldn't speak to that. Um, I'm not sure if there's um, claims of cover-up because they did end up rec recusing themselves, but uh, I could be wrong. I don't know. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Any final words that you, as people uh, try to process our current moment around issues like this, anything you really want uh, to, to say here that people should focus on? Um, I just, I, you know, just the continued struggle and continue um, that all the support should go to Aubrey, the Aubrey family and those who are willing to put their bodies on the line to take to the streets or take to the digital streets as they are now to demand that these sort of incidents no longer happen, which is a long and seemingly Sisyphean struggle. Thank you so much, Natasha Leonard. We hope you'll join us again sometime and thanks for all the work that you do. You're, if you're watching ACT TV, if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. We bring you interviews like this and with other progressive thinkers, activists, policymakers, et cetera, eight, nine, 10 times a week sometimes. So we will see you on the next one. I'm Juliana Forlano. Thanks for watching. And thank you for watching in our Facebook stream. It was nice to see all the folks watching on the stream today. Don't forget to come back. We're here Monday through Thursday with the interviews, with the activist headlines. So thanks for watching. We're going to sign off on our Facebook now and uh, keep watching Act TV's Facebook page. We hope we are of service to you as you, uh, uh, as you try to uh, navigate this incredibly difficult time for our nation. I'm Juliana Forlano. I will see you on Monday.